I'd like to share with you a story about why I became an addiction scientist, how I did it, and what we do. The journey began with my own personal experience with cigarettes. When I was a young boy, cigarettes and tobacco were all around me. It was part of everyday life. Thus being exposed to at least some kind of secondhand smoke, either from my father smoking or from other people smoking around me was a cultural norm. This was likely influenced by the perceived fashion or glamor of smoking at the time as smoking represented a westernized image. I was born in the US in the late 1970s during a time that my parents were finishing their graduate degrees at Iowa State University. We then went back to my family's country of origin, Iran. I was around seven months old at the time and we stayed in the country until I was around seven years old through the country's turmoil that ensued. This included the Iranian revolution, the Iran-Iraq war, which spurred our return back to the US. During these early years of my life, this was a period when the health consequences of tobacco smoking were only just starting to be identified. Thus, most people were unaware of the dangers of first or secondhand smoke exposure. And where we lived, nearly one out of every two people around the age of 20 had experimented with cigarettes in the 1970s. For this reason, when I was around six years old, it seemed almost normal for me when I smoked my very first cigarette at such a young age. I was very young, but wanting to act like an adult, I took my father's cigarettes and smoked for the very first time. Fortunately for me, the early exposure to cigarettes did not get me addicted, as cigarettes and cigarette smoke only exasperated my asthma conditions. So the experience was actually quite traumatic and very unpleasant, which led me to not continue smoking cigarettes. However, similar experiences are not shared by most others who experiment with nicotine or tobacco products early in their youth. And I've learned that I'm part of a very small percentage of people who do not go on and become addicted. This is important since experimenting at such a young age is a major risk factor for becoming addicted to drugs later in life. From this initial experience with cigarettes, little did I know that several years later, I'd be devoting my life goals to help understand why people start smoking and how I can help them stop. Today, I'd like to share with you the journey that brought me to where I am as an addiction scientist. My studies began as an undergraduate student at UCI. Because of my personal joys of storytelling, I chose drama as one of my undergraduate majors. Because of my passion for understanding disease, I double majored in biology. Since these two fields of study were so different from one another, I was thinking about ways that I could bridge this gap between these two disparate fields of study. So I came up with the idea that children who are in the hospital need ways to get their minds off the fact that they're in the hospital setting. Thus, to help, I started to integrate drama exercises, like improvisational techniques, into the pediatric ward as a form of psychosocial pain relief. I personally witnessed valuable impacts of this intervention in the children that I worked with, but I needed to learn more about the mechanisms mediating pain relief. Thus, I was given the fortunate opportunity to pursue a Fulbright Fellowship in Australia at the University of Queensland in Brisbane in the year 2000. I was studying and eventually published on the mechanisms of opioids like morphine and oxycodone in neuropathic pain. This was right at the beginning of the opioid addiction pandemic that was impacting the world and an era when opioids were just a new topic and not understood fully. This was a time when people were breaking into pharmacies simply to steal oxycodone pills, the very drug I had the unique experience to study in my Australian institution. I was amazed at the power and impact of opioids in mediating pain relief. I was surprised that opioids were prescribed for the treatment of chronic pain, including neuropathic pain, even though the addictive potential of opioids was so high. Given the tremendous drama surrounding the opioid addiction pandemic and the desire to reach people, I became fascinated by understanding what causes drug addiction and how can we help people stop. As a PhD student at UCI, I worked at one of the original NIH-funded centers aiming to identify the factors that underlie the susceptibility to nicotine addiction in adolescents and young adults. My published PhD studies focused on the mechanisms of tobacco addiction.
I was following up work initially done by one of the big tobacco companies who had released unpublished internal documents due to tobacco settlements on how other constituents in tobacco smoke could enhance the motivation of an animal to self-administer nicotine. This self-administration method is a valuable procedure and considered the gold standard for the study of addiction in humans using rodent animal models. Thus, using this method, I could study how nicotine and other tobacco smoke constituents could interact to enhance an animal's choice to take certain drugs. This is a rodent making a decision independent of anyone else, whether they'd like to take a drug or not. And I could see early on that out of the several thousands of constituents in tobacco smoke, animals favored nicotine self-administration when other distinct tobacco smoke constituents were combined. In the 1990s, Dr. Nora Volkow, the current director of the National Institutes of Drug Abuse and colleagues, had identified that smokers had a significant reduction of a particular protein in the brain called monoamine oxidase, or MAO for short. Interestingly, it was shown that these effects were not due to some genetic predisposition or random DNA changes in our genome, but it was something selective in the cigarettes that inhibited monoamine oxidase. And they knew this because when the smokers would actually stop smoking, the levels of monoamine oxidase would ultimately go back up to normal after several weeks. Thus, it was certain that it was something specifically in the cigarette smoke itself that was responsible for inhibiting these MAO levels in the brains of human smokers. Why is this important, you may ask? Well, as it turns out, these MAO proteins are responsible for the breakdown or metabolism of certain chemicals in our human brain, otherwise known as neurotransmitters or catecholamines. These chemicals are released from cells in your brain called neurons, and they allow for communication to happen between brain cells. You're familiar with the chemical dopamine, right? It's the chemical that's associated with drug reward and addiction. Dopamine is what's related to the positive euphoric feelings associated with drugs of abuse, sex, or even eating that really good piece of chocolate cake. And thus, the inhibition of this protein by tobacco smoke would inhibit the breakdown of the chemical dopamine so that the smoker's brains are basically swimming in this feel-good chemical. And I'm sure that you've heard of the statement that too much of a good thing could be a bad thing. Well, in the case of smokers, too much dopamine could be a bad thing. The reason for this is that nicotine acts as a stimulant. It releases further dopamine without having the basic mechanisms in the brain that are responsible for breaking down dopamine, when a smoker lights up for another cigarette, this could further enhance the addictive properties of cigarettes via the inhibition of monoamine oxidase. We studied this in our rodent self-administration model. Rats were given a choice on whether they want to use nicotine or not when their MAO levels were inhibited. We administered known monoamine oxidase inhibitors to evaluate nicotine use in rodent lines, as well as dopamine release in reward centers of the brain. We saw profound enhancements of nicotine self-administration and nicotine-induced dopamine release after uh, these monoamine oxidase inhibitors were administered to animals. This was remarkable, as it suggested that potentially other constituents in tobacco smoke may be interacting with nicotine to enhance nicotine use. This is important as it highlighted how advanced the engineering of the cigarette really is and the incredible need to study what these tobacco constituents are and what they're doing in addition to nicotine to our brains and our bodies to make us addicted to cigarettes and tobacco. Of course, no science is without limitations. And in particular, the MAO inhibitors in our studies were used as a tool to answer the question of whether MAO inhibition can increase nicotine self-administration. They are not found in cigarettes and they have se other secondary effects. Thus the work inspired our follow-up studies to pursue impacts of actual cigarette smoke extracts versus nicotine alone in mediating monoamine oxidase inhibition and nicotine self-administration. Aspects of this work that continue today, which is exciting. As, in, as I was finishing up my graduate studies, I took advantage of another incredible break presented to me. I had a chance to go to England, specifically in the University of Nottingham, to study and publish on the human adolescent brain. The work was, was important as 
It was one of the largest studies to date to evaluate the impacts of maternal tobacco smoking on genes, brain, and behavior of adolescent offspring. These are the impacts observed in children of mothers that continue to smoke during pregnancy. The work identified novel molecular and genetic markers that could mediate the genes, brain, and behavior consequences of maternal smoking including enhanced adolescent substance use in the offspring and structural changes in brain reward circuitry. We identified genetic targets, including distinct nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that bind to nicotine, underlying the potential mechanisms mediating the consequences of maternal nicotine and tobacco exposure. My passion for the field of addiction eventually led me back to the United States to study at UCLA, continuing to distinguish the mechanisms of nicotine and drugs of abuse in mediating learning, memory, and addiction. In human studies, I published on how the leading medication of smoking cessation, veraniclin or Chantix, as well as nicotine and cigarette smoke, interacted with nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the human brain using brain imaging studies. Further, I discovered how genetic modifications in nicotinic receptor subunits in rodent lines in order to enhance or eliminate their function could modify the behavioral impacts of nicotine or opioids. The work on opioids allowed me to come full circle with some of the initial drives that, drove, that took me into the field to begin with. Ultimately, I was given the remarkable chance to come back to my alma mater, UCI, where I was thrilled to work back in the lab. This is a university that I've been so passionate about as an anteater that I was even the mascot for the university during my freshman year in my undergraduate studies. Here at UCI, I continue my journey as an addiction scientist. Our laboratory has now expanded our work to also include other drugs in addition to nicotine and tobacco constituents, including stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine, as well as opioids. I have come to the realization of the linkage between these various drugs and their exposure effects as the brain develops during adolescence. Since the brain continues to mature well beyond our teenage years, Exposing young adults, particularly to nicotine, can be an opportunistic path leading to drug addiction, which is a major issue. We think that the research is important as there is an exponential increase in electronic cigarette vaping products, especially during adolescence. Since we know that the adolescent brain continues to mature well into our mid-20s, any exposure to nicotine is harmful on the developing brain. One of our most recent manuscripts has revealed that if adolescents are exposed to nicotine, they have enhanced cocaine use as well as fentanyl use in animal models. These effects are not observed if nicotine is given during adulthood. The findings support the reason why drug users begin their drug use during adolescence, often always after prior exposure to nicotine. Our studies also are relevant as the opioid fentanyl is the leading drug that's mediating the opioid overdose epidemic currently impacting the United States. Our findings suggest that if adolescents are exposed to nicotine via, for example, electronic cigarettes or tobacco products, they would be they would be using other drugs of abuse at greater levels, including stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine and opioids. The findings also have regulatory implications in supporting an increased age for purchasing and using nicotine products from at least 18 to 21 years of age and reducing electronic cigarette marketing to youth. In parallel, our studies have developed humanized genetic animal models to better understand how mutations in our genome could significantly contribute to addiction. Such ongoing studies in our laboratory are currently in the early stages of testing. Through our continued research, findings could help lead to future novel therapeutic intervention prevention measures to assist in cessation of substance use. Lastly, the ongoing therapeutic studies that we're working on aim to understand whole body contributions to addiction. For this reason, we're evaluating how do the gut as well as the brain interact to influence addiction with an emphasis on opioid addiction. Given the global health consequences of drug addiction, we have no doubt that our efforts are important and relevant to the overall public health of our nation and world. We are confident that if we can curb adolescent drug use or developmental drug exposure during pregnancy and childhood, including electronic cigarettes and tobacco products during adolescence, fewer individuals will ultimately go on and be addicted to drugs of abuse.
Such impacts are important now as we're dealing with other pandemics, including COVID-19, particularly since both have impacts on the lungs of smokers, electronic cigarette users, and those that are exposed to secondhand smoke. Understanding the mechanisms mediating addiction and providing improved therapeutic prevention intervention strategies could assist in reducing the over 1 billion people worldwide that are using tobacco products and other drugs of abuse. This very objective represents an important part of my laboratory's strategic plan, which I'm dedicating my life and passion toward. So what are the takeaways from our talk today? I would like to inspire you to reduce the use and abuse of nicotine and tobacco products in teenagers during pregnancy and development. Identify and encourage strategies to stop the marketing of electronic cigarettes and tobacco products to our youth. Continue to stimulate regulatory efforts to increase the purchasing and use of nicotine tobacco products to at least 21 years of age, if not later. Urge sustained efforts to identify and regulate tobacco constituents in the engineered cigarette or additives and flavorings in electronic cigarettes. Identify novel strategies if that if our youth are exposed to nicotine and tobacco products, we can provide therapeutic interventions to reduce the likelihood of further escalation of drug use and addiction amongst these populations. Be aware and inform our children of the harmful consequences of electronic cigarettes and tobacco products during development. By doing so, we can help with our most promising and valued members of our society, our children and youth. In my research that spans several countries now, I've learned why people use drugs and how people can stop. Certainly, if you're interested in stopping, I highly recommend speaking first to your healthcare provider. I also recommend thinking about multimodal comprehensive ways to stop, including enhancing your quality of life by exercise, psychotherapy, eating, and sleeping well, as well as learning about the most advanced therapeutic interventions and personalized approaches for drug cessation on the market. Please know, however, that while we're making significant progress in the discovery and therapeutic interventions for drug cessation, we have a long ways to go. Thus, your continued efforts in helping people not in initiate drugs or get exposed to nicotine tobacco products during pregnancy, early childhood, and adolescence is a very important step to, towards lowering drug addiction in the future. Thank you for your time and interest in our work, and thank you for listening to my journey in becoming an addiction scientist.